before we get to tonight's two topics, uh, Chinese art after 1300 and then after the break, Japanese art. Uh, but the first thing is to clarify a couple of things, although the vast majority, uh, probably 75, 80% of my students in both classes I'm teaching, were clear about uh, the directions, those that were able to watch the live right class where the exam was given in real time or watch the video. But I realized some people were uh, understandably confused by uh, one of the emails I sent. So I gave you guys uh, who didn't already turn a completed, uh, you know, form, a PDF. Remember, it has to be a PDF, please, only. And, of course, uh, all in one file. That's the key thing I want to emphasize of your midterm, completed midterm. Uh, if you didn't already turn it in, uh, I reposted it on um, YouTube. Uh, and it's, I sent an email about this, so you should all have seen that, and hopefully you guys check your email every day from the college or any class you're taking, uh, because there are a lot of important details and updates in that. So, so in other words, I'm giving people a break if they didn't, uh, you know, check uh, their email or look at the video of the lecture on the exam date, even on YouTube, uh, until the last minute because I took it down about 9 p.m. on the night of Saturday, because I didn't want to get up at mid or, you know, in the middle of the night and try to. So I went ahead and reposted it. I'll leave it up past midnight, but the deadline is midnight. If you didn't already turn a completed test in, and most people did, but there's still a number in both classes who hadn't, you guys will, those who didn't already have until midnight, March 17th. I know that's St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> but it is a class teaching day for me too. So that's the extended deadline for those who hadn't had time to complete the test or didn't log on until after 9 p.m. on to check it out on YouTube. I mean, uh, and between nine and midnight, it wasn't there. So because that's a confusion, I take responsibility for, I gave you guys that break, those who need it. Most people didn't though. The other thing is that a lot of people, well, not a lot, but several people in both classes are sending their files in in non PDF format or separately and you know one group is with the essays and then another one is with the you know answers of the first page and some sometimes even breaking up the essay answers into two different documents no that's not going to work it all needs to be combined into a single document because that's why I sent it out as a PDF because you can work right on the PDF and of course, I did mention that in class and, and a couple of people ask in both classes. But those, again, who don't watch the live videos, probably some of those were the ones who got confused. And for whatever reason, they send in more than one file. That just causes confusion. <laughs> and it's not clear, you know, it slows things down. So if you guys, won't, uh, you know, had sent in or will be sending in uh, those who didn't already, uh, a file, please make sure it's a unified single file in PDF format, the whole exam from first to last answers. So it can be logged in that way and then forwarded either to my readers or myself. Now I started grading them so far, they're, they're pretty good, but I nowhere near, you know, even 20% of the total graded because I'm still getting them. So uh, somebody asked me, when are you going to get them done? Give me a break. <laughs> I haven't even logged them all in yet. So uh, after spring break, probably toward the end of spring break, but certainly before the next class. Remember, we don't meet next week. Everybody knows that that's right. Uh, you guys get the week off and uh, hopefully you guys don't go down to South Florida and uh, join a super spreader event. <laughs> that's your business. But uh, anyway, the point is that uh, we have no class uh, for uh, a week. So that's a two week hiatus, which should give me and the readers time to grade all of the midterms that those that were turned in correctly as PDFs in a single file. So that's really the main thing I wanted to, to, to get across, but I will take any questions you have now about anything relating to now some people still haven't finished their first paper so you want to get busy on that because here we go not long after the spring break you're going to have your second paper and then of course finals are sooner than than you might think right coming up uh, in a few weeks. So uh, I've always told all my classes this, uh, I find it's in almost unavoidable that anyone who waits 
to do both of their papers till the last week or two of the semester, very likely won't get an A or a B because it's just too much work. It's too much of an overload, uh, all to cram that all in at the end along with studying for the final. And remember the final is not cumulative. So what we cover tonight could be on the final, at least one slide from the Chinese uh, uh, slides and maybe one from the Japanese will be on the final. So I'll tell you when we get to ones that are really important where I always say, you know, this one I'm not cutting from the study list because we'll have the same format for the final, same number of questions and slides to write about, same uh, procedure. You know, I'll give it in real time and then post it and I'll leave that one up till probably, you know, like eight or nine in the morning on Sunday, but I would like to get them by midnight on the Saturday after the test so that I have time to start grading them and get and my readers too and get them back to you. Now you will get, uh, if you turn yours in already, you'll get your grades probably before the uh, ones that I'm getting in the last two days now, because those are already logged in, right? Most of them. Are. But uh, I try to get them all done within about two weeks from when I got either the deadline or in this case, I extended the deadline or, or when I got uh, all of the ones turned in on time. Same things with the papers. I sent the paper grades out. I hope you guys, those of you who turned your papers in on time, uh, those were, were quite good. I mean, you know, not everybody got an A, but nobody totally bombed the paper. And there were plenty of uh, good things that in each paper, people seem to uh, take the time to think about, you know, analyzing but sometimes people forgot a part of the formal analysis. And if you did, you, you can see that on the cover sheet because that has all the summary of how you did for each paper. Okay. Any questions does anybody have right now about grading? Uh, um, yes, please go ahead. Is it possible for you to say like the names of people who still need to turn it in or need to return it in if it's not right? Um, uh, midterm. Well, no, because I didn't make a list of that. I was working right up until just a few minutes ago um, uh, on those files and I've gotten so many, like I said, sometimes I get four files from the same student and you know how long that takes to stop, open them all, read and figure out what is this, what, where does this go? So it just slowed me down so much that uh, it's a good question. Uh, you know, I suppose I, if I, you know, thought of it a couple of days ago, I, or even yesterday, I could have uh, prepared such a list. So no, I don't, but here's uh, the best I can do is if you sent me, I would think you would know any, and I don't mean you personally, but any individual student knows uh, that they sent me something that wasn't complete, which I'd be surprised, but that they wouldn't know that, then you can go back and look at the slides you didn't complete, right? Because I'm guessing some people might have done that. In fact, it looked like one or two people sent them in with only the first essay filled in and, and blanks. Now, if I catch that, I will send you an email, but I can't guarantee I'll catch it on dozens and dozens and dozens of exams being, you know, dribbling in over, you know, days and days. I, I can't guarantee that. So if you want me to check or better yet, you check, that's, that's a safe way to do it. You would know, you know, look at your file that you sent me if you think there could have been some lapse or some, some problem. Uh, and I will then, uh, you know, uh, you, then you should email me and I will say, oh, well, no, you don't have to email me. If you don't want to, you can just then resend it. If you think, oh, oh, I realized I didn't answer the th second or third, whatever essay question, or I send it in three or four different uh, segments. Well, now those I have gotten back to. I just spent, like I said, a couple hours doing that today for both my classes. So I'm trying to catch all the ones. When I see that the same name of a student three different times, I know something's not quite the way it should be. So those I, I open up before I forward them to my readers uh, or even think about logging them into my, uh, you know, world book so that I, you know, have a record of who submitted them on you know, on time. Same thing I did with the papers. And if there is something, you know, obvious incomplete, because on the exams, I'm giving you guys the extension through midnight tomorrow, um, that, then I would email you. But if you have any doubt, yeah, you probably should just email me. That's probably the safe thing. Um, or, to, and then that means you, you might need to take time. If you didn't finish one of the questions you have until midnight tomorrow, 
to uh, look at the missing, whatever it is, essay of one or two of the slide analysis questions. I hope that helps. I realize the question, it'd be easier if I just read you a list, but uh, that's not, I, I don't have that information at my fingertips right now, but I do in my computer, of course, in my files. That All I good. Thank you. So yeah, that way, if you if you know you, you sent something that was incomplete, you get an extra, you know, opportunity, right? Second chance, whatever you want to call it, extension to do so, to complete and say, this is the final version or the complete file for my midterm. Of course, you should say that in the email. But if you're not sure, you can email me and I'll check and then I'll get back to you. Uh, if you do that by tonight, I'll get back to you tomorrow. I'll spend most of the afternoon looking these over. So if I see it myself, I'll let you know, but I can't guarantee I'd catch them all. So any doubt, uh, double check your own records of what you sent me and or maybe both email me and ask for me to verify. But uh, if, if you know you didn't complete it, then just go online and whenever you get a chance between now and next tomorrow night at midnight, uh, double check and, and then fill in, you know, the answers you didn't already send and then put that all into one PDF and of course send it to my AOL. This is important. So that's why I wanted to set aside a few minutes. Any other questions at all about either the, the midterm or any other I notice most people haven't done more than one or two people have done 15 points of extra credit, but uh, very few people have done more than that, uh, or as, as many as that. So you guys still have plenty of opportunities for extra credit right on up until, but not after the final. I will accept things up until, but not after the final exam date, because then I have to enter them and log them in, total up the points. So remember that'll raise your, 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 your letter grade by up to a whole if you need it, or you just want a cushion for safety or margin for error, uh, I recommend you do those, you know, any of those options. And you can always email me if you have a question or right now you can ask if anyone has any question about extra credit at this point. My article, by the way, is still out there. The one I, it was a week ago today on uh, the, the school name uh, blame game is what I call it. It's in the op-ed section of the Monday, March 8th, Santa Rosa Press Democrat. It turns out it's only on the online edition and it didn't get in the print edition. So there is a link to it. It should be easy. Um, let's see, did I get, did everybody get in? Yeah, here we go, admit Tom. Okay, welcome. You haven't missed anything, uh, Tom. We just started going over uh, you know, the, the, the last few minutes about exams and how to make sure you turned in the best finished, uh, you know, file or, or completed exam uh, to me and <clears throat> double check if you're not sure you did that. All right. Any other questions about anything relating to grading? All right. Let's get started with tonight's uh, top, first topic, which is Chinese art. Now I'm going to mention a couple things as context, but I think this time I'm going to, hang on, let's see. I wanna hide this thumbnail, here we go. And enlarge this. Um, okay, I've been to China and um, I, I can say two or three things before we get to the first must know. This isn't obviously, it's a map you see of China, of uh, the modern uh, borders of China. Um, it's an impressive culture. Uh, I was only in Southern China, which this used to be called Canton. When I grew up, that's what we called it. Now it's Guangzhou, which is I think their third largest city and by far the oldest, way older than Beijing. We're gonna talk about Beijing because of course it is, has been since the 1400s has been the capital of China. And obviously it still is today. Anybody see the news with the sandstorm from the deserts? They have a lot of deserts in China whipping up some, it was like when we had that, remember the red sunset we had last September, was it? Yeah, remember that? It wasn't about the fires, it was just, well, yeah, I guess it was from the smoke uh, in, in, uh, somewhere outside of the Bay Area, if you recall that, made the national news. Yeah, well, they have that same kind of weird yellowish orange sky and over all of Northern China. Anyway, when I was in Canton, Guangzhou uh, and Hong Kong, and Macau, they don't have that there. They should. That's now part of mainland China. Uh, everywhere I went, people were fascinated. There weren't that many. This is in the 90s, the mid 90s. 
there weren't that many Americans traveling by themselves. Groups of tourists, yes, but uh, I, I traveled independently as a journalist. And I'm glad I did because I got to talk to people, meet them, that most of them I met were so well educated. They spoke English, if not several other foreign languages. They knew something about American history and culture. They wanted to ask questions and show me their, you know, the sites in their city. It was really a great experience. And some of the buildings in Canton were well over a thousand years old and they weren't reconstructions or reproductions. They were temples, pagodas in stone or wood that were some of them nine stories tall. We didn't have any buildings that tall in this country until skyscrapers were invented in the late 1800s in Chicago and New York. So yeah, they, their culture, as you know, is one of, here we go, here's your specific context you don't have to write, but it's one of the five oldest urban civilizations in the world. Uh, the others we mentioned were India, right, Babylon, Egypt and Mesoamerica. And we're going to get to that one next uh, two weeks from tonight because we're not member meeting in uh, the spring break next week. Anyway, so that that right there distinguishes it. Another is you probably know this, but if you don't, you might want to make note or write this is it is the most populous country on earth, but not by a lot. Something happened to the audio. I can't hear anything. Can mm -hmm. anyone else hear anything? Uh oh. I can hear him fine. Yeah, thank you. That's an important detail. Shoot, I'll give you a minute to see if, because I didn't mute anybody deliberately, but if I accidentally did, you should be able to unmute yourself. I, I don't mute my students, as you know, at least I try not to. No, maybe it was something on my end. I, okay, I that's again. good to know, because I mean that you fixed it, I guess. All right, back to the point is China is the most populous country in the world by Oh, you know, it's less than 100 million now because uh, it's got 1.4 billion people and India has over 1.3 billion and India's growing, its population is growing faster than China. And India is one third the size. Again, it may sound like useless math, you know, arithmetic, but I think it's relevant to know. Comparing those two, the two most populous countries in the world, right? Uh, with very similar populations in terms of their total number of people, uh, India has one third the space that China has. So that means that India is three times more crowded. But China, here we go, is more relevant to most of us, is four times more crowded than the US because we on China almost, you look it up, it's very similar. 3.6 million square miles in both countries within the borders, land area we're talking about. And uh, we have one quarter their population. So it's easy to figure out. They are four times more crowded as a country. And then they also have, of course, uh, multiple historic shifts in their history. We're going to talk about the latter ones from the last 600 years or so. The Mongols came from, of course, there it is, Mongolia across the border. And uh, the Great Wall didn't keep them out, as it turns out. So they actually founded Beijing. So Beijing is not a, an ancient city, not even close. Guangzhou is. And several other cities in China are uh, the major ones on the coast. Uh, but uh, Beijing is a late, very late medieval city, you know, the 13, 1400s, is even, you know, most of the world, that's not very old. Um, and, and it has been the capital since about that time, since the late 1300s or so. Yeah, or late 1200s. So by 1300 is a period we're covering and after that, uh, Beijing was then the capital. And that was built by the Mongolians, the Mongols for short. They conquered at first just northern China and then they pressed south and conquered the rest of it. So now let's go see the first must know. Okay, here we go on the syllabus. This is, the title is A Thousand Peaks and Many Ravines. That of course is R-A-V-I-N-E-S. A Thousand Peaks and Many Ravines. Very descriptive title. And of course, the location for all these is China, but I'll say that China, 1693. Well, this is a classic example of Chinese scroll painting, landscape scroll painting. They were famous as were the, the, the Japanese, but more so the Chinese, they were doing it earlier. So some would say the Chinese invented uh, scroll painting uh, for landscapes. And that would mean that they were 08, and this is, I think it's nine or 10 feet. I can even give you the exact height, but you need to know that for the exam. 
or length, I mean, right, we're talking about from top to bottom, the average, just say, of scroll painting with a landscape on it would be eight to 10 feet long. And of course, they were meant to be hung, this is part of the meaning, right, of all these facts, uh, on the wall of someone's house or perhaps a temple or even sometimes the, the royal palaces of the How local rulers. Was? Sorry, go ahead. How long did you say it was? Eight, eight to 10 feet, but let's go ahead and I can tell you the exact length. I mean, I don't have that memorized and you don't have to know it. Uh, eight and a half feet, there we go. Yeah, I've seen these in um, uh, the different uh, homes that I, I only went into a few people's homes. Most of the time it were public buildings that I was allowed to go into in Guangzhou, but they're in the shops. You can purchase, but there are copies, of course. This is historic, of course. It is what, over 300 years old. So it's from the last, this is the next fact about the meaning, the last Chinese dynasty, right? The king, and that sounds like you should spell it with a K. No, it's pronounced king, but it's Q-I-N-G, of course, capital Q-I-N-G, which was the last royal dynasty of China, the last group of emperors. By the way, I know I do this a lot, but this is an aside some of you will appreciate. If you like great movies, there's a movie made about 15 years ago, won the best foreign film, and it's still hauntingly uh, beautiful and yet sad and, and fascinating. It's called The Last Emperor. It's about the last king emperor and what happened to him during his lifetime. He lived from the end of the Qing Dynasty through the Japanese invasion and on into the Cultural Revolution under Mao and survived all of it. It's, it's pretty impressive. Uh, it's called The Last Emperor. It was made by an Italian director. Some of you know his name, Bertolucci, and he deserved the award he got for best foreign film. I think it's like somewhere around 2003. Anyway, that should be available. I'm sure it is on streaming. Anyway, so this, this was the last made, this scroll painting of a classic Chinese landscape was made during the last, uh, you know, dynasty, royal dynasty, of course, in, in China. Some would say the Communist Party is the current dynasty of China, but whatever. But they don't inherit there, right? Like uh, dynasty monarchies, of course, it's all hereditary. So they were the last ones, the king, Q-I-N-G. Oh, so what style is it? Well, here's your first new term, right, for tonight. The terms, no, we only have three tonight. Uh, and that is Chinese three-tier perspective. Now let's get a closer look and you'll see some aspects. There's, a, there's several things to say about this, but let's define that term first. Chinese three-tier perspective is a technique for depicting depth invented by Chinese painters, comma, we don't know exactly who did, but a technique for depicting depth you could say space, either one's okay. Uh, invented by Chinese painters, and I'm sorry, it's a long definition, in which there are three, three features. Okay, in which there are three features. Number one, the objects in the foreground are sharp and closer to the viewer. Uh, those, you could say, those objects in the foreground you can say sharply depicted, but that's obvious. So I just say sharp and cl closer to the viewer. You can say larger if you want to, to indicate they're closer. I'll repeat this whole thing. And then uh, the second feature is objects in the middle ground. That's considered this area here. Have a misty, hazy look. You see the mist there covering the whole bottom sections of all these mountains in the distance there, right? So again, number two is objects in the middle ground have a hazy, misty look. And number three, objects in the distance are sharp, but uh, smaller and further away from the viewer. So I'll say it again, I'll repeat that. Chinese three-tier perspective is a technique for depicting uh, depth or space invented by Chinese painters, comma, in which number one, objects in the foreground are shown, I should just say, keep it simple, larger and sharper. There we go. In which objects in the foreground are shown larger and sharper, right, than the other objects. 
again, just keep it simple. That that's what I should have said at the beginning. So I'm sorry if I got off base on this definition. Okay, objects in the foreground are shown larger and sharper. Objects in the middle ground have a hazy, misty look, number two. And number three, objects in the distance are shown sharp, sharper and smaller. That's the way we sometimes see things like mountain ranges, especially they love mountain ranges as the main topic for their landscape paintings. Uh, often look when of course there's a mist coming up off the you know floor of the valley below or a stream or river running behind or below, I mean the mountain. So, so that is a realistic way of depicting space. It doesn't involve scientific perspective. There's no atmospheric perspective because this is all, um, you know, very simple color scheme. Some of the landscape paintings get more colorful, but most of them were all, you know, monochromatic. I mean, it's kind of bluish ink here, right? At least in this version of it. Okay, so let's now take a look at the whole thing for the other part of the meaning, which is what does it depict besides obviously mountains, the title tells us that. This is a classic example of the traditional landscape painting that goes back a thousand years in Chinese history. If you took Art 1.1, and we'd be seeing one of the first Chinese scroll paintings of landscapes that would be a thousand years old. So just see, this, this is an example of, you can say the enduring or long lasting or continuing tradition that's over a thousand years old in Chinese scroll painting of including specific objects in their landscapes. And what are those? We'll just list a few. You can see them when you get closer. Temples, some people call them pagodas. We're not getting that definition yet. So just say, you can say temples, but the pagoda is a kind of temple. So temples, houses, right? Temples, houses, trees, of course, right? Rocks. Mountains, let's get back, mountains, streams, that's less obvious, but actually if you get up close, you can see that there are, there's, there's a stream in the middle ground here. Streams, right? And mist, they liked all those things because that's what you see when you look at a you know, long view towards mountains from you know, somewhere where you have a, 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 lar a long perspective, you can see if very far away. It, you see those things in the Chinese landscape. And I got to take a bus and a train through um, Southern China, not just to those cities, but to the countryside. And that's, I noticed that it did look like a lot of the places outside the big cities had the same appearance they had a thousand years ago. And some of the temples in Southern China where they're much older, the, the, the culture there, uh, than Northern China. Uh, and, and you'd see those things. Again, I'll, I'll make that list I'll repeat that list. The objects included in any traditional uh, Chinese landscape painting, uh, which is a tradition that's over a thousand years old. It didn't start with a king by any means, uh, the last dynasty, included such objects as temples, houses, trees, rocks, streams, mountains, and mist. Usually all of the above or at least most of them. Okay, that's pretty much the whole meaning on this particular uh, piece. This would be a museum quality piece. This wouldn't be for sale. Well, copies of it might be. Um, <clears throat> if I had time, I'd show you, you know what? I will. At the break, I'll go get my one little bit of landscape painting I bought legally with the certificate so I wouldn't get arrested at the border from a Chinese antique shop. And, and you'll see some hint of the same techniques and it's over 140 years old. Now that's not very old by Chinese history, but for us it is, right? It's from about 1880 and it's signed. Yeah, I'm at, I'm, it's one of my prized possessions. The first earthquake, it'll break in shards, I'm sure, if it falls off my wall. But anyway, it's in my dining room. I'll, I'll get it during the break and show it to you before we uh, wrap up tonight. Okay, so formal analysis. Well, I already mentioned the main technique for space, but you should add, in addition to three-tier perspective for space, there's also overlapping and diminishing size. Those are the three techniques. There's not, I don't really see foreshortening here. I, they weren't using that technique much 
in the traditional landscape. So again, just overlapping, diminishing size and the three tier perspective. Okay, then we have thick or bold lines. You notice that around the mountains, especially, but also around the rocks and trees in the foreground and then thin lines, you know, in the middle area here, somewhat the lower mountains. So it's a mixture of bold and thin. There was strong realistic modeling everywhere you look on the boulders and rocks in the foreground, on the uh, middle ground landscape here, the hills, and then of course the main mountains in the background. So strong, uh, realistic uh, modeling and simulated texture on all the objects that I just mentioned. Uh, it is obviously both, well, it's more dynamic than stable, but the trees are pretty much upright as are the uh, temples, right? And houses in the middle ground. So mostly dynamic, certainly on the landscape itself, except for the trees. And then the uh, structures here are mostly stable, but that's less than a third of the total. So majority of the uh, composition is dynamic. It's roughly balanced. This area here, you notice, is roughly the same as the mountain range, and I'm sure that's deliberate. So it has a rough balance top to bottom, and I would say left to right, too, if you draw the line straight down here, roughly balanced. Of course, this is, the rhythm is obvious with the repeated shapes of the mountain. Well, all the objects I just already mentioned, right? The colors are cool in this one or neutral. Actually, I've seen this in a more accurate reproduction. So, the, but blue would be cool too. So, if you look at it, if it's on the exam, I'm not saying it will be, uh, and you were to analyze it, you would be correct if you get full credit. If you said bluish, cool colors, it's actually more black and white with slight blue tints, and then of course offset with the white. So, those are all cool colors. If it was only black and white, of course, it would be neutral. But here it looks blue, so we'll say cool. Okay, um, am I forgetting anything? Um, texture, I think I covered that. Uh, stable, yeah, I think we got everything. All right, I'm skipping, I'm giving you guys a break because you know I, I don't want to spend more time on, on uh, something that might not be on the exam. And I did promise to cut something, so let's see. Ming Dynasty Flash Forbidden City Portal Map. Uh, you know what? It isn't on the syllabus, so you don't have to worry. This is though. Oh, this is one of my favorites. So this one, this one I won't cut from the study list. Okay. Remember, I told you I always give you that heads up when that happens. So make sure you take extra thorough notes and review them. All right. The second one on the list for week eight of the must know slides. Hundreds of birds admiring peacocks. Hundreds of birds admiring peacocks. I think everybody knows, but just in case you haven't ever written that word, peacock is P-E-A-C-O-C-K-S. China, and you can ignore the C, the little C, but we don't know the exact year, about or circa 1500. Okay, so this is a Ming, M-I-N-G, dynasty uh, landscape. Or is it really a landscape? Actually, I would argue that it's not exactly a landscape because you don't see in distance here. You don't see a lot of features fading into the distance. So I would say it's a painting of a scene from nature. You could just say it that way. A detailed natural scene on silk. Now, is this a scroll painting? It could have been used that way, but normally those were tall and narrow. And this is, you know, much wider than most scroll paintings. So I don't believe it was originally created as a scroll painting. But the fact that it's uh, on silk would, of course, be, as you might know, if you know, China produced silk before any other culture in the world. And so uh, this would be, yeah, it is a scroll. Sorry. So it is. It's just an odd shape for a scroll. So I just double check. Sorry about that. But here's what you should focus on about the meaning of this. The detail is classically Ming style, M-I-N-G. Remember, that is the second to the last, right? There's only way to write it. The Ming dynasty was the second to the last Chinese dynasty. They were the ones who miss, who, uh, sorry, um, what's the word, uh, replaced the Mongols. They uh, took over China from the Mongols and uh, ejected the Mongols from power. 
in fact, kicked them back towards Mongolia. So they took back China from the Mongols. That's one way to say it, the Ming, M-I-N-G. And then later they fell to the Qing dynasty hundreds of years later. Chinese dynasties on average last 300 years. I had a, don't worry at this, but I had a great professor during my early years at Berkeley as a history major who had been to China. He actually was of, uh, I think he was English or maybe Canadian, but he, you know, he wasn't of Asian heritage per se, but his whole training was, and he'd spent years living and working in China. And he was telling us that, you know, the 300 year cycle of Chinese history, we might be in that category ourselves. And this was back in the 70s. So who knows, it might give us about another 60 years. Uh, anyway, before there's a change of some kind, who knows? Anyway, it's an interesting fact that Chinese dynasties tended to average about 300 years, just as the Russians did. The Romanovs lasted 300 years and the ones before them. It's a, a strange phenomenon of many, not all, but many uh, uh, cultures that over the last thousand or more years, that there's a cycle of change that seems to sit in after about two and a half, three centuries. Okay, but you didn't need to write that. Now you do need to write these facts. So what are we looking at? We're looking at, of course, a garden. I mean, it may be not be obvious, but it is. It's a garden, probably an imperial garden where either the emperor and his family, you know, spent time or some royal official maybe had uh, done some kind of landscaping. And so it's a garden and peacocks are symbolic in this painting, this is the most important fact, of the ruling class. And here they are, they're beautifully detailed. So this is typical of Ming dynasty painting. Uh, which would be a large number of their paintings are like this. Okay, it's a scroll painting, we, we covered that, but it's not your typical landscape and there's no three tier perspective here. So don't, don't write that. I'll talk about the technique for space in just a few minutes. So it's meant to symbolize the ruling classes being admired quite literally by the scholar class. And that's supposed to be what the birds represent. As you may know, the Chinese invented the idea of civil service. Well, the other culture was the Byzantines, uh, but that's for Art 1.1. Yeah, in the West, the idea of trained bureaucracy without which you cannot have a functioning urban civilization. You can't, whether you like bureaucracy, bureaucrats or not, you have to have them to run, you know, everything with the post office to the courts, right? So uh, the Chinese invented civil service where you had to take tests if you didn't know that you should write this, you probably, many of you knew this, uh, you had to take exams, civil service exam to get into a profession that you were then trained for, for a long time. And then you took very rigorous, multi-day long exams. If you pass them, then you might work your way up through that profession. So this is supposed to represent the scholar class, people who had entered their professions by studying uh, you know, diligently and passing exams, civil service exams. And of course their patrons, the people that paid their, you know, bills, uh, whatever their salaries, I should say, not their bills, uh, <clears throat> would have been the ruling class, would have been the emperor and his family and his immediate, you know, extended relatives and so forth. The, the, and governors, of course, that he appointed uh, the emperor in different provinces. So, so the ruling classes are symbolized by these peacocks. I don't know any of you, if you have, but if you ever have heard a peacock, uh, we had one, me and my wife, uh, about uh, 20 years ago, more, 30, my God. Yeah, uh, before we moved to my current house in another neighborhood of Berkeley, there, there were two that lived in the back. They were both male, and they would go off at two and three in the morning. And you, there's no way you can ignore that sound. It's a very distinct sound. They're very proud and noisy animals, so you couldn't ignore them if you wanted to. But here they're being admired by the people that they employ to run their empire, right? And of course, it is an empire. The Chinese conquered many of their neighboring cultures, as you probably already know. And during the Ming Dynasty, they expanded. That's another fact you could mention. The Ming Dynasty expanded the borders of China and therefore created an empire. Anytime one country or culture conquers another, that creates an empire, or at least a small one, right? And the Ming actually really expanded all the way down towards Vietnam, although they couldn't conquer the Vietnamese. They were too uh, too independent. Uh, but they definitely conquered Tibet at that time and the Uyghurs, right? Which you all know about what's going on there. Uh, you know, the, the, the Turk, Turkic population, or you get to say Muslims, to the far west. 
and then pushed the Mongols back up into Mongolia and conquered part of it. So they expanded the borders of their empire uh, uh, quite significantly during the Ming Dynasty. So it was, some would say, a golden age, if you look at it that way. So they were powerful and proud. And that's the symbolism of the people. Please go ahead, question. Hmm? I thought I heard a question. Yeah, OK. So what we see here uh, is symbolic of the social and or political uh, structure of Chinese society during the Ming Dynasty. But the other part of the meaning, which is much simpler and straightforward, and you can see this, is the techniques used during Ming Dynasty uh, painting, whether it's a landscape or a close-up view like this, a view of nature, meticulous detail. Look at that. I love this tree trunk. Look at that. You can probably feel the roughness of the bark. And you can see it's an old tree because it's you know worn out and missing sections of the trunk. And the same is true for the feathers of the peacock and uh, the birds' wings, the flowers. It's, it's beautifully done. I really like this piece. And so meticulous or attention to detail or meticulous depicting of a, all the details in this painting is classic or typical of the Ming Dynasty painting, school of Ming Dynasty painting. That would even be called a school. Remember, that's not a physical school. It's just a group of people who have the same style, right? And so for about 300 years, you know, just, just say during the Ming Dynasty, that was the norm for the best painters. And this guy would probably, whoever painted this is probably one of the most skilled and, and successful painters in China at the time, which is why it's in one of the main museums in China. And this is uh, a good example of the attention to detail, but I prefer, that's kind of a cliche now. So I think a better way to say it is the meticulous detailing of all the main objects. And in this case, that includes various species of birds and peacocks. Okay, formal analysis. Well, there is some empty space here. So I guess you'd have to say, and the trunk seems to stand out. So yeah, it is unbalanced somewhat towards the uh, right, but it doesn't feel that unbalanced. However, left, uh, sorry, I mean, top to bottom is definitely balanced with the area covered by the tree branches. And these birds above the middle here, and then the areas covered by the plants and peacocks down below. It's roughly equal top to bottom. Uh, and the rhythm is obvious with the peacocks and the birds, the branches, the flowers, everywhere there's rhythm. It's almost entirely dynamic. I don't see a stable straight line anywhere in it, not really. The similar texture, superb. The modeling, super strong. That's part of the style, as I just said, of Ming's, the meticulous details depicted in their paintings uh, are classic examples of that attention to accurate, realistic, you want to say, or strong modeling and simulated textures on all the objects, but more so on the tree, the tree trunk itself, I think, than anywhere else. Uh, and then we have the bold outline on the tree trunk and thin outlines on most of the rest of the objects is because they want you to notice the tree first. The artist wanted you to notice that. Uh, and the largest mass, oh, that's what I forgot to mention in the uh, last slide. The largest mass would be the mountain chain in the distance of the, the first one that we talked about, uh, right? Uh, a thousand peaks and many ravines. The largest mass was the mountain chain in the foreground. And then you decide everything in the bottom is all jumbled. So it's hard to say what was the second or third largest. But here it's clearly it's the tree trunk. And then it's the peacocks and then the larger birds. It's pretty straightforward. And there's thin outline around all the other objects, but not around the tree. That's bold, absolutely. Um, and the colors a mixture, warm and cool, of course, warm on uh, some of the flowers, right? That almost looks like a pink carnation, a red rose maybe. Uh, and then we have, um, of course, kind of neutral on the tree trunk, although it has, because of the way it's the background behind it, this is silk, by the way. So this would be, you know, almost like a warm tan color on the tree trunk, which a real tree trunk would be. So mostly warm colors with only some cool uh, details on a couple flowers and some of the birds. Um, balance, rhythm, of course, repeated shapes of the flowers and the birds. Oh, for space, yes, overlapping, foreshortening. And here it's hard to say, I don't see either I said foreshortening, I misspoke. I don't see foreshortening because the tree trunk is just 
you know, across at the same distance from us, uh, the uh, far right side. So I don't see foreshortening. It's overlapping and somewhat diminishing size because these birds are smaller. So again, overlapping and diminishing size, but that there's no other technique. There's no Chinese three-tier perspective here. This isn't a distant enough view. Okay, let's move on. This is a fascinating one, but it would be much easier to describe the meaning because it's not as complex as the last two slides, but this is a must know. So make sure you take the notes on it. Okay, uh, it's the third one on our list. Ming Dynasty Flask, China, 1435. Ming, M-I-N-G, of course, you know, Dynasty Flask, right? F-L-A-S-K, China, 1435. Well, this is early Ming. It doesn't matter if it's early or late, except to say that's when the Ming Dynasty had displaced, or uh, you could say kicked out if you want, I suppose, uh, driven out is a better word, driven out the Mongol conquerors who had ruled China for nearly 200 years. Now, see, that's different than those dynasties. They usually ruled longer because they were invaders, conquerors, occupiers, right? And they adopted Chinese language and much of Chinese culture, but they were never fully accepted by the majority of the Chinese people because they were outsiders coming in and taking over. And so they finally were overthrown, right? And uh, expelled from China in uh, the uh, late 1300s. So by this time, just what, two or three generations later, uh, early Ming, uh, the, the Chinese techniques for uh, painting vases, now it's a different medium, right? Vase painting in China has very specific rules. And the Ming were among the most skilled of all the different dynasties in terms of their vase painting. This shows an example of that. Let's see, it looks like we might have um, chat here. Is there a question? I... Uh, yes, that's right. That's right. You got that exactly. Thank you. Yeah, you guys, it's always good that you're helping clarify things. But anyone can ask if they want verbally too at any point, obviously in any of my lectures. Okay, back to what we're looking at. Well, it's obvious it's a dragon but it's an inverse, or I think the right word, I don't think you should say reverse, inverse image of a dragon. Because what's around the dragon is what forms the outer edge of the dragon's body, which is the waves of a stormy sea rendered in blue ink, of course, on the ceramic and then fired, obviously, right? And it might, I had an aunt that was really good ceramic artists. She sold a lot of her stuff over the years in several different states that she lived in. Um, and so I got to watch her make these kind of things from, she had a kiln that was, every time she moved, it was the most expensive thing to do was to move her kiln. Anyway, so these would be, you know, painted obviously, you could say drawn, I guess, if you want, uh, on, onto the ceramic before it was fired. So these lines represent waves of, of a stormy sea or an ocean in a storm. And the dragon is superimposed over them, but it really it isn't. It's just the negative space. You see that here? Well, the white is, that there's just no lines. So it's a brilliant little technique, but guess what's on the backside? I thought I could get both front and back images, but I couldn't find them. And, these are from Stockstead's files that they send us instructors. So they, I didn't see one of the back, but according to the, the text, and I'm sure it's true, the other side's a reverse. The dragon on the opposite side of this vase was painted with these blue lines in about that much detail, you know, with the scales and, and everything around it is white space. So it's, it's, it's a very interesting, you know, the phrase yin and yang, right? Opposites, right, that are common. Uh, considerations of many cultures, philosophies, and, and religions is obviously the yin and yang here. The point is you could just say that the opposite techniques are used, keep it simple, on the two sides of this flask. On the side we're looking at, the dragon is formed by negative space with all the lines around the outer edge of the dragon's body, whereas the reverse is true of the dragon on the other side. It's formed by actual lines uh, all through the body, the image of that dragon's body. And the background is negative space or just white space. Okay, but there's a little more to the meaning than that. And that is what a dragon symbolized. I think a lot of you already know this. 
uh, two things, at least in Chinese culture, and not only Chinese, but of many other Asian cultures and even some Western cultures. So just say China and many other cultures. Uh, think of a dragon as symbolic of, of two things. One, the powerful forces of nature, like wind, right? And uh, lightning and, uh, you know, well, raging seas. Well, you see that behind the dragon's body there around it. So powerful forces of nature like wind and lightning and storms. Uh, but they also more specifically in China, at least, are symbolic of the ruling classes. The power, I should say, the power of the ruling classes. And if you haven't been to Chinatown, of course, you couldn't have this class two times for Chinese New Year. But I used to go there all the time during you know, New Year celebration with friends, of course, who visited and wanted to go see it. New Year's Parade in Chinatown. They're wonderful. Of course, the dragon is a symbol that you see every time there's a celebration, not just the Chinese Lunar New Year. <clears throat> and it's ancient tradition going back to the earliest, if not before the first Chinese dynasty. So just say it's an ancient symbol of the power of the ruling classes, as well as the power of nature. Uh, and, you know, things like lightning and uh, wind and, and storms. Okay, that's the whole meaning on this one. Balanced? Yes, if you do a line down the middle, clearly it would be balanced left to right. But of course, because of the narrow neck, depending on where you draw the line, or although if you do the line here, the middle of the bowl, right, it, it would be roughly balanced. So you, you could decide how you see that. Clearly balanced left to right, uh, less obviously, balance top to bottom, perhaps just you, you could say it's unbalanced toward the bottom if you do the line here. Because if you measure from here to here, of course, your line is going to be somewhere up here. Uh, the bold outline is obvious on the entire background here. And in essence, that's what the dragon's body is made up of, because there are the lines around it that are formed by the background. So there's bold outline in both the waves of the ocean of the stormy sea and the dragon here. Uh, there's no similar texture on the dragon, but there is on the waves, of course. Uh, it is totally dynamic. Again, not a straight line in it. The colors, obviously, blue and white, totally cool colors. For space, there's overlapping. The waves overlap each other. The dragon overlaps the, uh, the ocean or, or the water behind it. Um, and then we have um, the rhythm, of course, of the dragon's body. It's, it's a claws. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Welcome. Okay, if you just joined us, we're just finishing up on the third must know slide. This is the um, Ming Dynasty flask. Anyway, so then we have the uh, largest mass is the dragon, of course, and then the waves. Now, if you want to count these flowers, I would I would say, of course, some people might see the the, the, the water, or I should say, the raging sea behind the dragon as a single mass. And if you do, then that's the largest mass. Again, you have freedom to decide when it comes to the largest masses on any of these, these slides, if, if they're on the exam. Uh, but I see it as you know individual waves. So the dragon would be the largest mass, then each, each wave, and then the flowers around the neck. Um, bold outline, see, mod is there modeling? Um, I I don't really, it's hard to say. I, you could say there's modeling on the waves, but not really. Waves would not likely have modeling. I mean, there is some shadow, I guess, under, you know, those hundred foot waves off of, what is it, Santa Cruz? Where they, I saw, I can't remember where, where they have those monster waves that once a year or twice a year that people go down and surf. I never understood people taking that kind of a risk, but anyway, <laughs> uh, oh. then you'd see some shadow underneath the top or crest of the wave, and then you could call that modeling. But do you see that here? If you do, you do. I, I don't. I don't see modeling here, except that there's a contrast between the dragon's body and the background. So in a way, you could call that itself a kind of modeling. Again, I'm going to give you guys flexibility. Someone had a comment or a question a moment ago? No? Okay. Sorry, if you do, please jump in at any point, obviously. I think we've covered just about everything for space overlapping. Yeah, balance and obviously the rhythm of the, all this. Okay, um, let's move on. Now, this is really one of the, this is one I'm not gonna cut. Some of you 
I hope you've read your stocks that it's a, it's a nice succinct uh, I'm glad to see she kept it you know very uh, minimal but adequate to describe the importance of this complex this is a really important one you want to study extra carefully has a high possibility of being on the final number four in our list of uh, slides for week eight Forbidden city, just like it sounds, two words, forbidden city. Beijing, that's B-E-I-J-I-N-G, China, Beijing, China. Again, when we were kids, we called it Peking with a P-E-K, but nobody says that anymore. Beijing, China, and you don't need the little C. Remember, that's always just means we don't know the exact year, but it, actually we do, but it was a complex build over many decades. So just say circa or about, or just right, 1400s, meaning the 15th century. So what are we looking at? It's the royal compound of the rulers of China during both the Ming and Qing, that's member spelled, if you're just joining us here, Q-I-N-G and Ming is like it sounds M-I-N-G. The last two Chinese, just say the last two Chinese royal dynasties, the Ming and Qing dynasties ruled from this city within a city. So here, are, there's quite a bit of background to say, so I'll try to keep it just in the highlights. Beijing was built by the Mongols before this site was completed, but they did rule from this area. And they had their own compound, but it was completely destroyed when they were replaced or, or, or you know, displaced, I'm sorry, displaced by the Ming. When the Ming were over, uh, sorry, the Mongols were overthrown. <laughs> you got to make sure I say that again slowly. When the Mongols were kicked out of China by the Ming and replaced by them, second to last dynasty, uh, they just destroyed what had been there before, as often happens, you know, when there's a change, regime change. And then they rebuilt it this way. So this is a Ming, M-I-N-G, era complex. Beijing existed as a city and the space that this occupies were there under the Mongols, but it's nothing like it was when the Mongols were there. So this is a Ming dynasty, this whole complex. So what does it consist of? That's the other part of the meaning. A series of courtyards, temples and bridges, and I'm going to name a couple because that's part of the meaning. Sorry, somebody had... We had another chat thing here. Yeah. Okay, good. That's thanks. I thought maybe there's a question that I could answer. All right. So what we're looking at is the uh, first courtyard, right, is, is uh, crossed, you could say traversed if you prefer, or crossed by a man-made stream with five marble arched bridges over it. You, you can see pictures of this. If you ever see the Forbidden City on the news, you, you do see that sometimes. By the way, this is Tian, Tiananmen Square sometime, somewhere outside the, the, the compound here. This is you know now a historic site and open to the public. Of course, a lot of tourists go there. Uh, so this first courtyard has a, a, a man-made stream traversing it, crossing it and five marble bridges uh, over it. Then we have a much larger inner courtyard, okay? And that's behind the Gate of Supreme Harmony, which then opens into a much larger, you see that's easy, two or three times as large, uh, plaza, right? or courtyard, you can say courtyard because it's got walls around it. And then behind that, right, is yet another courtyard in which the compound for the emperor, his family and his staff are in buildings that are further away from and not allowed, well, now they're allowed to be seen by tourists, but originally the public was not allowed. So the emperor would sit in the hall of Supreme Harmony, right, to, greet people when he was, you know, having public audience, right? He would sit on his throne. And if you ever see that movie, The Last Emperor that I mentioned, it's just a really haunting movie. I mean, you know, whatever. If you have any interest at all in this subject or just, you know, how, how world-changing events affect people's personal lives in very intense ways, 
uh, I can't think of a better movie than that. Um, they show him as a little boy because he was only like a teenager when he was overthrown by Sun Yat-sen, the demo first revolution in China. It wasn't the communist. It was uh, supposedly going to be a democratic system that didn't last long. So um, he sat in the, where the arrow is, you see there, the Hall of Supreme Harmony. You don't have to know which building is which. That's too much detail. You just say behind the um, gate of Supreme Harmony, and another courtyard, yet a third courtyard here, right? This gate, and then a third courtyard, you would you would have the hall of Supreme Harmony where the Emperor greeted the public. And then his residential and family compounds are in sm buildings that, that are smaller and more secluded and not open to the public. The entire thing is about two square miles. That's the rough size. I did some calculations. So that's pretty big. But I've had people say, oh, this must be your ask. If it must be the largest world compound in the world. No, no, that's Versailles. That's 10 square miles outside of Paris, where the kings of France ruled for centuries. Um, <clears throat> but this is one of the largest world compounds. It, it probably beats, uh, you know, let's see. Uh, well, I don't know what Bezos has. Anyway, I can never remember his name. The head of Microsoft. My mind is going on me. Uh, he has a compound up there in Seattle and no one can get close. I remember looking at it from the outside with some friends when we were driving through on the outskirts of Seattle. Anyway, just say there aren't many private compounds this big. The closest could be Hearst Castle, right? William Hearst. But it, it's different than this because it's, it's on a hillside and it's kind of, you know, incorporates a lot of open, natural, undeveloped space. This is different. This is all man-made, everything here you know, is landscaped and built, you know, for the emperor and his family and his staff. Okay, it's plenty on the meaning here. You could just finish up by saying it ceased to be the compound, the royal compound in 1911, or you could just say early 1900s, but that's the year that the last emperor was overthrown. And it's since then it's been a tourist site pretty much. N none of the rulers after that, not the first guy that overthrew him, his name was Sun Yat-sen, you don't have to know that, or Mao, right, or the Chinese communist ruler since him, have ever tried to occupy this. It wouldn't be good uh, optics, as they say. It wouldn't be a good PR move. Let's move back into the royal palace now. They were trying to get rid of that part of their heritage. But they didn't destroy the compound. It's intact. All right. It's one of my bucket list items. I want to see this in the Taj Mahal if I can, maybe the Great Wall. All right, let's do a formal analysis. Well, you can get up close. See, I love this. And you can see, right, the uh, Gate of Supreme uh, Harmony here, right? And the Hall of Supreme Harmony behind this large. And then these are the marble bridges going over the river here. It's hard to see them from here, but they're shaded by some of the... Uh, yeah, bushes and trees on either side of the landscaping. So here we go. Formal analysis, completely balanced. Oh yeah, that's actually part of the meaning. It overlaps with space. So I forgot to mention that the symmetry, total, absolute bilateral symmetry of this compound, or you could say balance in the design of it, is symbolic of the harmony that Chinese uh, philosophy and Chinese, right, um, philosophers, you could say, or, or, or uh, intellectuals, believe is the role of their, was the role of their emperors. Their emperors were supposed to protect the harmony of the universe under their rule because they believed they were the, well, they didn't use the word chosen people. That's kind of a Jewish phrase, right? Uh, some of my Jewish friends would say that. So just say they believe they were, quote, heaven's people they actually use that phrase people chosen by heaven or by the gods however you want to say that to rule the world and they ruled over most of you know asia at that point right when they were in the high point of their empire here uh so you could say they they felt they were destined the people of china and particularly the ruling class of china the emperor and his extended family were meant to rule over the world and this was the center of that world according to that concept and, and their philosophy so their uh, compound their royal compound where they lived in and ruled had to reflect that harmony and therefore it had to be balanced okay now back to formal uh, for space you've got a series of open courtyards walled courtyards uh with you know tall gateways, right? These are pretty tall. They may not look like it, but that's, whoa, whoa, I didn't mean to do that. Let's get 
down here. Yeah, you can see, look at these people. Yeah, these are not little, you know, 10 foot tall walls. They're quite uh, impregnable. Uh, no one ever took this palace by force. Well, actually, I think Sun Yat Sen's soldiers did because <laughs> his staff, the last emperor's staff, had, had uh, abandoned him. But, you know, it was never assaulted, right, in a war or anything. So it, these are meant to protect the courtyard. So you can just say protected, uh, courtyards protected by, by high walls at various sizes of, uh, buildings, residential and public buildings. That's about the best you could say about size. Oh, uh, but yeah, you could add that it's it's all real space, of course. About a two square mile compound, the whole thing, total. Okay, and then we have the rhythm, obviously, of these roof lines on these pagoda looking buildings, right? Actually, some of them are pagodas. I would find pagoda in the second half of tonight because we have some of them with uh, chart. Well, actually, now that I think about it, why don't I give you that? It's a short definition. Let's get that one done. Then we'll have one more after the break. Pagoda. Okay, here we go. Pagoda, right? You see it's on your list of terms to know. P-A-G-O-D-A, -A, of course. Pagoda is a multi-level temple with wide overhanging roof lines you know, on each level, right? A multi-level temple with wide overhanging roof lines supported by projecting wooden brackets. Literally every pagoda I've ever seen, no matter what the outer walls are made out of, the roof lines are usually wood and they're supported by wooden projecting. I'll just say it again. And say um, a pagoda is a multi-tiered temple with wide overhanging roof lines, comma, supported by projecting wooden Beams, period. Okay, so some of these are pagodas. Let's see if we can even tell from here. Well, that's the whole of, well, that's the whole of harmony here. Yeah, these are probably temples. They would have been for the private use of the of the of the uh, emperor, of course, in his family. Temples here. Uh, these these are pagodas. I'm sure of that. Tell by looking. Anyway, so what you have is a series of structures that uh, create the rhythm of the roof lines. That I just described projecting outward and of course the courtyards the shape of them the rectangular shape so lots of rhythm and the color is mostly warm on the buildings and of course cool on the it's you know stone or concrete it's probably stone in the courtyards and uh the green of the trees would of course technically be cool um, and they are part of the landscape design so it's a mixture more warm though obviously if you've squint you can tell the balance of the colors inside the compound are a warm reddish color uh, the red clay towel and then of course the red on the stone walls too there's no technique for modeling it's just the shadows created by the sun the lines are visual lines around the edges of the courtyards and the buildings there's no you can't see in this photo carved lines you might be able to tell those are painted, but you don't have to get that detailed. It's too far away. So just say there are visual lines around the edges of all the structures, fences, wall or walls, and, and buildings. Um, and then let's see, the largest mass, that's hard to say, but I would say it's the main inner courtyard. It seems to me, if you count that as a mass, which I would, the largest structure would be the Hall of Supreme Harmony here. It may look smaller than this one, but it, it actually, it's it's on a raised platform. So it's about three levels. This one's at most two. So that would be the second largest mass. And then you decide what's the third if you choose to do so. Okay, um, and then we have, let's see, textures are the real smooth texture of a clay tile on the roof. And the stone is rough except for the marble bridges here. There we go, there's one of them, yeah. Uh, so there's some smooth marble, but mostly rough stone on the, the courtyards. And then real smooth tile on the walls. And you can't really see, I mean, on the roofs, I meant to say, sorry, you can't really see the walls, but the walls are made out of wood and that would be rough on most of these spells. In fact, they're almost all wood, rough, real textures. Am I forgetting anything? Let's see. Balance, rhythm, space. I think that's it. Okay. This is a very interesting piece, The Next Must Know. And it's a poet on a mountaintop. That's pretty straightforward, right? Poet on a mountaintop. 
doesn't matter if you break it into two words, but the way it is in stocks is one word, mountaintop. Poet on a mountaintop, China, of course. And again, little c, you can ignore and just say 1500s. So this is a Ming Dynasty painting. And it is a landscape painting. But I'll bet a few of you might have already thought, if you're looking at it carefully or you studied it for you know, from the text before tonight's class, you might have thought no, to yourself, if you didn't, now I'm going to tell you. <laughs> Is this an example of Chinese three-tier perspective? Yes and no. <laughs> I don't mean to confuse you. But here we have the mist here and here in the middle ground. So it's unusual that the mist is in the foreground, but the objects, the main object closest to us are larger and sharper, clearly that whole cliff, right? And these two houses or three houses and the trees. And then the object in the background is smaller, but it's not sharper. So this artist was almost kind of hinting at what we call atmospheric perspective, even though it isn't a colored work of art, it's a painting in black and white. So there is no warm and cool color here, but there's that kind of feeling because this mountain back here is kind of a misty color. So this artist was a little bit more individually, let's just say, uh, you know, stylized or his technique was more individual. There we go. In depicting some aspects of a landscape. Otherwise it, it is more so than not an example of Chinese street tier perspective because of the mist in the middle ground and the objects being sharp and larger in the foreground and larger in the background, they're just not sharper. So it, 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 it covers most of the take of the aspects or features, I should say features of Chinese three-tier perspective. But what's much more important is what's going on. This is the poem, the poet is this guy here. And it's probably, we think historians believe a self-portrait, but I think they verified this. And this is a talented, as he would have to be to be a scholar, a member of the scholar class was very highly respected. And, you know, like I said, you had to really earn your way into that with these uh, civil service exams and, you know, loyalty, lifelong loyalty to the ruling class and all, but you also had to show talent. So this guy was, who created this painting also was a poet. That is a poem, which is supposed to be symbolic of this man, right? This scholar, you'd be a scholar, a scholar slash poet slash artist. In other words, he had multiple talents, which they would have had to, to, to rise to the top of their level of bureaucracy. So he was both a painter, painted this scene, including Slozy himself on the mountaintop. And then he paints as though his mind was projecting this composition into the sky in front of him. It's a fascinating concept. I really but, like it. Does yes. it mean does it mean anything that it's in the sky? Like, is that anything? That's a good question. No one's ever asked before. I think so, but I don't think there's anything. I just reread the section just to double check uh, in Stockstead to see if there was something I hadn't thought of. Um, I, th I think it's meant to be that the poem is something to do with the beauty of nature. And so his thoughts, yes, I would say yes. And you could just say some scholars, I'm sure there are others, but <laughs> you could just say the instructor, but actually I've read that there are plenty of other examples of this kind of painting where the poem's in the hanging in the sky. It, that idea, that technique, I mean, is symbolic of, of the mind of a, a poet or artist, size poet, uh, you know, not only being inspired by the beauty of the nature, he or she could be a woman, mostly were men though, it's, it sees in front of them, but their thoughts are becoming part of the landscape, blending with the images they're creating in their poem, almost melt or blend into the landscape. I know that's an odd thought, but actually it isn't if you think about it, yeah. So yeah, it's a good question. Uh, so that you could say, that's what many, just say many scholars believe is the purpose of having it floating like this. Uh, it's fascinating, yeah, because uh, I don't know the exact translation, but there is some part of it. You don't have to know that much detail in um, in Stockstead, let's see, just because we're running okay on time, we're still gonna probably end a little early and not have to rush through the Japanese ones. Yeah, here we go, there is a translation. Uh, you don't have to write this, but for those who might not have read that, 
in stocks. There's no way I was going to memorize this whole thing. White clouds like a scarf enfold the mountain's waist. You see that, don't you, right? Stone steps hang in space. That would be, of course, the mountain and the things leading up to the, the houses there. So again, stone steps hang in space, a long, narrow path. Alone, leaning on my cane, I gaze intently at the scene and feel like answering the murmuring brook with the music of my flute. That's very poetic, of course. <laughs> Not to be corny and cliche about it, but yeah, I just, uh, I love this kind of painting. And that's somewhat similar to the one, not, but more detailed than the thing I told you, I, you guys, I'll show you after the break that I bought in China, which is one of the few objects that I, you know, managed to bring back intact. I've done that on other trips. And when they get back home and outside my suitcase, oops, something broke, but this one survived intact. I'll show it to you at the end of the break. Um, okay, or maybe just before the break. Actually, why don't we do that? Because then we want to segue right into Japanese art and not confuse the two subjects. So we're almost done here. Uh, formal analysis uh, with this half, right? And we're still going to end. Uh, we're going to take a slightly earlier break, but let me do show you that piece because it directly relates to this. And there's a very, you'll see what I mean. There's a similarity in the composition of the piece that I bought. And it's just a three dimensional, you know, object with a similar kind of painting on it but not this old, of course. This, this is what, five CC, 500 years old. Okay, formal analysis. Balanced, oh, lovely. I love how, the, when you add the poem in this section of the cliffs here to this section here and the, and the cliff in roughly the middle, it, it's roughly balanced. Uh, you could say it's weighted toward the bottom, but because of the mist down here, I, I'd save the sky in the mist roughly, although this is somewhat solid. So you decide if you think of it as weighted toward the bottom. But to me, it has a floating feeling kind of so the, the solid object. I mean, so I'd see it as balanced both ways. <clears throat> and there's bold outline, of course, around the cliffs in these houses, thin around the mountains in the distance. And even this one mountain over here. And then we have for space. Yes, there is Chinese three-tier perspective. It's just not quite as clear or detailed in the distance as it usually would be. But there's your mist in the middle ground. And then there's, of course, overlapping. Here I see foreshortening. I do see that on this cliff. I'm a fair one agrees. Submitted text is quite realistic in the foreground. And that's on the cliffs, the trees, and to somewhat lesser degree, the houses. Um, and then we have, it's, I don't see much stable at all, except a couple of trees, but even those trees are tilted somewhat. So I guess some of the trees are stable, but just about every other object is dynamic. It's, well, he's standing upright, but then you see his, let's get up closely. Isn't that, I just like this. It looks like he's looking down thinking, you know, what's down there, <laughs> composing his poem as he enjoys the beauty of, like I said, Chinese landscape, I only saw a little bit of it, but it's just very beautiful and impressive along the Pearl River, which is the third largest river in China, is the one that runs all the way from thousands of miles inland in the mountains, of course, down into the bay that uh, Canton slash Guangzhou is, is on. Uh, actually, it's on the Pearl River estuary, <clears throat> so it's not right at the bay. In Hong Kong, of course, it's totally different. Hong Kong is just mountains surrounding this intensely crowded city of 8 million people in this tiny space. Yeah, China was some. I'd left an impression on me. I, someday I want to go back. Okay, then we have, let's see, the last couple of things. Uh, texture, I'd say it's pretty realistic, isn't it? On the cliffs and the trees. It's less so on the houses. And uh, on the mountains in the foreground is it should be. It's fairly realistic, but it isn't in the mountain there, that one and this one in the foreground. So it's a more similar texture is realistic than not, but some places it's soft and diffused. <laughs> the largest mass, will you decide? This main cliff? <laughs> um, I would say so. And then maybe the edge of this other mountain, which leads to that path he was referring to in his poem. Uh, he probably lives in one of these houses, I would guess. Uh, and then I guess after that, you decide what's the next largest mass, either one of these two. 
uh, you know, kind of mist shrouded mountains would be second, the third or fourth largest mass. Um, mentioned the modeling, let's see dynamic. Oh, color, it's all neutral, black and white, except for this one little bit here. And that's probably his signature. I don't know that for a fact, so don't write that, but that's probably what it looks like what I saw as the signatures in some of the uh, artwork I looked at in, in China. And museums, you know, that one of the best collections of Chinese art uh, in the Bay Area is at the Berkeley Art Museum, which I think is going to be open again. You see Berkeley Art Museum. That's extra credit. Or the Asian Art Museum, of course, in San Francisco, either one. But actually for room per, if you're interested in landscapes, Chinese and Japanese both, there's a really good high quality, small but very, very good uh, level of uh, skill of several hundred years worth of landscape paintings at the Berkeley Art Museum in Berkeley across the street from the UC campus. They should be open again if they're not already soon. All right, let's see, I think that's it, balance. Yeah, and of course the rhythm is obvious with the cliffs and the trees and so forth. All right, let's do our last one and we're gonna make it kind of quick because I do wanna show you. This is the Gingbang Mountains. That's an odd name, I know. G-I-N-G-B-I-A-N, -G Mountains, China, 1617. Okay, so uh, this has the same techniques, so I don't need to re-describe them of the right Chinese three-tier perspective. And here's, this is farther away from us than usual, but that qualifies as middle ground because the mountains in the distance the farthest away objects are sh sh smaller and sharper. So this qualifies as all three techniques used in the, uh, or, or features used in Chinese three-tier perspective. And of course, overlapping is used here. And it's a scroll painting, right, of a classic landscape. And uh, based on the date of this, it would be late Ming. And by that time, toward the, just say toward the end of the Ming and during the Qing, Q-I-N-G, remember, their last dynasty, some artists, some landscape painters uh, stylized their details. And I would say this does. You see, it almost looks slightly abstracted, these shapes on the mountains. They almost, somebody, I think it was Stocks, they said it looks plastic or something like this doesn't quite, I mean, it's not like it's not realistic at all. We'll get to the formal elements in just a minute. But it isn't as, you know, sharp and realistic as that first slide we saw, the thousand peaks and many ravines, or, or as the details on the uh, many, uh, right, hundreds of birds admiring peacocks. This is a little more stylized. So late in the Ming, M-I-N-G dynasty, and on through the last dynasty, the king, some artists, some last artists chose to stylize, or you could say, almost make abstract imagery out of their the detailing by making it less super sharp and, and, and realistic. That's about it on the meaning here. Oh yes, and there's a poem here too, but here you don't see a, a poet standing around you know, projecting his thoughts into the sky, but that's a common uh, technique, even if there isn't a an artist or poet depicted self-portrait in their own work. Sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. So formal analysis, Overlapping uh, is used here and diminishing size plus Chinese three-tier perspective, pretty much the same three techniques we've been seeing on all these paintings. The rhythm is obvious with the trees, the, 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 the cliffs here, the mist, uh, right? And then we have similar textures, pretty realistic in the foreground, less so in this part of the middle ground. And again, pretty sh sharp on the main distant figure feature, which is the, the mountain at the top of the horizon. So you'd have to say there's mostly realistic survey textures, but less so on literally in the middle, you could just say in the middle where there's some stylizing, some simplifying. Stylizing means simplifying uh, of certain techniques. The lines are mostly bold. You notice that here. There's some thin line, I guess, on the few of the rocks here and there, but most of the lines are bold. The modeling is strong, most everywhere, except for where the mist is, of course. Um, the rhythm is obvious with the trees, the rocks, the mountains. Um, I don't see anything stable. It's, it's all dynamic here. The largest mass, well, that's hard to say. I'll leave that to you. Is this all one mass, the middle ground here? Uh, if, if you don't think of it that way, then maybe the mountain in the distance, uh, or you could say, 
the foreground, if you count that as one single mass, you, you decide. Okay, so uh, let's see. I think we've covered just about everything. Um, is it balanced? I would say roughly, yeah. I mean, this is empty space here because it's a lake, right? And then this is just, oh, I don't know, sand or some other kind of un undeterminable uh, ground area. Um, I think if you do a line across here, it's certainly bounced top to bottom, and I would say roughly left to right. So here's what I'm going to do. Uh, this is the end of this file, and I'm going to stop share. And if you guys can literally hang on one minute, I'm going to show you this. I'm not going to talk about it very long, but just so you can see an actual object from China with the um, <clears throat> techniques that we just saw. And you don't have to write anything, but it's in my diary. We'll be back in less than one minute. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to get the image large now. My wife had moved it without telling me. <laughs> she put one of her own landscape paintings, <laughs> which is fine. She's actually quite a good painter. Okay, I got to be careful if I drop it. I'll never forgive myself. You see the similarity? You've got a guy in a boat, and then uh, it looks like perhaps the artist, maybe a poet, he's got a little bit of reddish you know, at least the top part of his outfit is, and you see the trees and the cliff, right? Rendered fairly realistically. The boat looks like it could be floating in, in space or in the sky, but it's supposed to be obviously the man on the shoreline on the lower edge of the cliffs, looking out at someone passing by in a river. And then there's your signature. I know that's a signature, the red part, because I asked the uh, curator at this, shop. It's government run everything there is. Of course, the Communist Party has to approve which optics they allow foreigners to purchase. And, you know, the prices, I don't know, they might be set by the individual shopkeepers. This was in uh, Guangzhou. Uh, but I just liked it because it has some of the same features that we've been talking about and just enough color to be interesting. And yet there, you don't see the mist here. That's the one thing that's missing. So for whatever reason, this artist didn't choose to use that. But according to and you see it's even got the mark on the back. According to uh, the shop I bought it from, it's about 1880. Not ancient, but old enough to be historic. Okay, let's take our break. We're right at eight, so it's perfect timing. All right. We'll see you guys in 15 minutes. Okay. All right. I'm going to pause the recording now. <laughs>